I want to introduce uh, Josh Nash, Nassau, he's in California, otherwise known as Hosh Nassi. <laughs> he's going to give a brief presentation, well, a presentation on antennas, DIY antennas, and uh, hopefully everybody will learn something from it. And without further ado, Josh, it's all yours. Thank you. Great. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Thanks for having me out. Um, all the way from California to you guys in New Jersey. Hope the weather's nice. I believe it's uh, 60 degrees outside where I'm at, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what it's like there. Uh, anyway, my name is Josh, K-I-6-N-A-Z, and you might recognize my face from the internet. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Hosh Nasi, and uh, we have a segment or a group of videos called the Ham Radio Crash Course. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you can go to the next slide. I started out like some of you might have, got introduced to amateur radio in Boy Scouts. It was uh, during a summer camp, and I had a scoutmaster pull out a walkie-talkie, and he started talking about repeaters, and I, for the life of me, didn't know what he was talking about. I thought somebody put an answering machine on the top of a mountain with some tapes, and they were playing messages. I didn't get it. Later, though, I graduated from college, became an engineer, and I met somebody named Richard Crum, KE4GNK, who's kind of was my first Elmer. We worked on a satellite terminal together, and he kind of related the antennas we were working on and the frequencies we were operating in to amateur radio and how we could use it. So that got my interest up. So I ran out, got my technician license, and my first radio, which I, I still use, I have it with me today, my Yesu FT60, which um, great radio. Uh, I am a software engineer, systems engineer by trade, so a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about wasn't from what I went to school on. I learned this after the fact. I, I didn't know much about electronics or antennas for that matter, so it was just through persistence and interest that I learned about antennas and all that good stuff. So you can go to the next slide. I think it says Hosh Nasi on YouTube. I'm, I'm with you. All right. So uh, I started making videos on YouTube in 2006, and they were just my hobby-type videos. I, I like to do metal detecting. Um, in California, there's still gold in the hills, and we go prospecting still. So I made videos on that and just anything I was interested in. But I noticed uh, about 2014, I made a couple of ham radio videos, my Yesu FT60, among others, and I really enjoyed it. So I decided to just go further into it, and thus the ham radio crash course was born. Part of that, I made some Baofeng videos, which you might have seen them. Uh, they're probably my most popular videos. And it was about the time the UB5R came out, the cheap and expensive radio you could get it off of Amazon. I initially had difficulty programming it by hand, so I decided to figure out what it was all like to get it connected to the computer and work it out that way. And so that was kind of what started me down the road with amateur radio. And next slide, I think. Yeah. So my most popular video to date, and believe me, we're, we're ramping up to the antennas, I promise, stick with me here, <laughs> um, was the Why People Hate the Baofeng Radio. And I attempted, oh, I heard it. Was that somebody asking a question or was that feedback? Oh, sorry. So I attempted to condense things that people liked and didn't like with the Baofeng into something that um, covered all the bases and kind of explained how the radio was with our community. They are in the zeitgeist now. They're everywhere. And I, I thought it was important to kind of talk to them. So next slide. So what I'm trying to do, <laughs> building up to this point, is for me, it's not just about Baofengs. And I looked at that as kind of a stepping off point. We're at a point with our hobby now where we can get people started in very easily, but it's cheap and it's kind of just purely a radio to use. And there are some downsides to that, and I want to kind of bring people forward into graduating from Baofengs into what we're going to talk about, antenna building and other types of radio to kind of grow the hobby that way. Baofengs are great for getting people in the hobby, but I, I worry that they'll just kind of plateau there and not progress from that point, even more so that they won't even get their license, that they'll just use it, and that's a whole separate problem. Not what we're here to talk about today. So how antenna building hooked me on radio. 
going back to when I had that FT60R, I got really interested with, um, well, how do I connect this to my car? And so I started asking why. I started out as just merely talking on the radio, wanting to talk to my friends on the repeaters that I had met, was able to connect to my car. It worked fine. Had fun with that. Great. I eventually started saying, well, how does this work? What does the antenna do? How does it connect to the radio? And if I change the length of it, you know, would I, would I be able to, to hit the repeater with better quality, get that full quieting that I know a lot of people like to do? So I started looking out with what could you make yourself? At the time, I didn't even realize this was a thing. Again, going back to my Elmer, he recommended, well, why don't you think about building an antenna? And he pointed me to some books, ARRL handbook, among other things. And I, it was like, okay, you know, I can start with this. Added bonus, my wife loved it because we're saving money. You know, weird trick, wife loves saving money. So my first antenna I built, and, and you can actually view this on YouTube, was a super J pole. And it's basically what they call a copper cactus. And that's that round part you see on the image you're looking at. And the reason, kind of already mentioned it, I wanted to kind of have a permanent fixed antenna on my house that I could connect to a mobile uh, radio in my office to be able to talk to my friends on the repeater and not just be devoted to either the car or the handheld like I was before. So in building this thing, going out and getting the plans for it, going online, getting the calculators, figuring out the math, I learned about antenna matching, what you needed to do there, how to bend the copper to do that cactusy part, and most importantly, how to mount the thing with a mast that would be uh, would not affect the antenna made of material that will last because it's going to be sitting outside and all that fun stuff. So. Most importantly, though, my video, I took a really a ton of comments on how bad my pipe sweating skills were. This is like the first time I was really actually sweating pipe, and uh, I learned a lot. So that's pretty important stuff. So I have the slides. Uh, Mark has the slides. He can make it available to you. These are links that you guys can use. I built my uh, copper super J pole to the middle of the two meter band. And basically, it's just a matter of taking the numbers, cutting the pipe, and sweating it all together. Pretty simple first antenna. So with my successful J-pole build, I had some confidence, and I, I you know, ask why more? How does this other stuff work? What else can I do with radio? And this is where I realized I could take things people had been talking about, working satellites, which we'll get to, and other things, and say, well, I can figure this out. And, and ideally, this is kind of how we, we get people more engaged in the hobby is we give them an in, a, a little seed of, of interest and say, you know, you can do this on your own and, and we're here to help. And so I reached out again to Elmer's and, and started asking why more. And I said, OK, I'm going to build my next antenna. My next antenna was a tape measure Yagi, right? These pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can find the plans online, which will be linked on the next slide. And the reason why I wanted to build it was I started getting into APRS. That's a Kenwood D72 there on the couch, which um, I still I still love that radio. I, I use it today for FM birds. That's a, a dual simplex radio, which is really, really nice. You can connect it on your headset. You can listen to your receive side while you're transmitting, which is really great. And uh, sadly, the D74 doesn't do that. But I digress. Uh, what I learned in building this particular one was Harbor Freight is awesome. If you guys have Harbor Freight, you guys say shake your heads up and down, hands up. Yeah, I see. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, not the best quality, but cheap, and you can get pretty much whatever you're looking for. So Harbor Freight's pretty awesome. And for a tape measure Yegi like this, I think you can get tape measures for free on some of their sale days, which is great. Uh, you just cut that thing down and get your elements together. The calculator I'll show in the next slide in a second here. Um, but basically, I didn't know when I started out how Yagi's worked. I didn't realize that basically it's a dipole. There's only one element or one part of the antenna that's the driven element, and the rest are either a reflector or directors that are focusing your RF. I understood that it, it was a beam. I understood what Yagi was because people had said it, but it wasn't until I started experimenting with and building 
and researching that I learned, oh, hey, this is how we focus our RF. This is how we try and take some of our power and instead of just everywhere, like with an Omni, that we're going to focus it. So I learned about gain. I learned about directionality and as a byproduct, direction finding. I, I used this antenna in multiple occasions of tracking down people. Um, oddly enough, a couple of them had bell fangs uh, that were transmitting without a call sign on our repeater frequency. And we actually found the individuals, um, in some cases, talked to them. I wasn't there for when, when they talked to some of them, but had some FCC reports go out. And we've, we've had done a pretty good job of, of keeping the repeater pretty clean. And a lot of it was by getting out there and actually um, doing some DFing. So I recommend great antenna for somebody getting started in that area. I don't know if you guys have fox hunts. Fox hunts are pretty popular in Southern California. There's a couple of clubs that do it. The only thing this is lacking is an offset attenuator for uh, when you get in close, but it works okay. Oh, where's my slides? So the slide here, I took this image directly from the, I believe it's the legios.net. This website has been up for a very, very long time, so you probably all have seen it. I think this is a really great antenna to build uh, with a club like yours or with um, young people. If, you, if you're trying to get youth involved in amateur radio, directional antennas are really great because you can have somebody you know, go out, transmit on a given frequency, and you can show them you know, the directionality of the antenna. It's very easy to build. It doesn't require a lot of tools. Um, a really, really good recommendation there. Strong, important part, though, is don't forget that hairpin match. When you go to tune this up, um, you're going to need that hairpin. And the website that has the link there is going to go into some more detail. But those are all the measurements you need, and you can take that right off of there if you need to copy that later. So about that time, I started getting into HF. Um, I had friends that were already on HF. I joined a club at this point when I changed jobs. And they have a very large and active club. So I was like, oh, I got I to gotta go get my general now. So with the confidence of, of building some antennas and, and being more proactive in my operations, getting outdoors with the Yagi, trying to do the ISS, APRS, some direction finding, um, I, I thought the general was a pretty easy endeavor. And I have learned since starting the Facebook group, the Ham Radio Crash Course, that a lot of people struggle with the antenna building portion or sections on the general and um, on the extra. And it, it really helps if you've got some firsthand knowledge, some actual building knowledge as you go forward and, and advance your ticket. So with that confidence, I started asking why more. And as things came up, I said, I can do that. And I, I guess that's both good and bad. I think I've got just enough knowledge to be dangerous. So make lots of mistakes, but amateur radio is great for that because you can have fun making mistakes, figure out what you did wrong, you learn something, and you can move forward. So that, uh, there, this is good, talking about mistakes. Uh, my third antenna was some kind of messed up dipole that I made. It was literally just a uh, center connector that I connected to my coax, and I just broke the wires out. Um, it was cut to match to 20 meters, but there was nothing inside that white thing. That's just PVC pipe. So what I learned is, you know, what is a balance? A balanced, unbalanced device. What is that for? Why is that important if you're feeding with coax versus twin lead? And that led to all kinds of doors opening up with building antennas at that point, particularly wire antennas. I learned the relationship of the links of the antenna to what frequency you want to be resonant on and why that's important. You know, you can throw a tuner just about on anything, but if you really want to guarantee that you're getting all that power out of your transmitter as possible, then it's best to learn, you know, cut to frequency, cut to the band you want to operate on. Tuning a wire dipole, which um, I think... I'll talk about on an upcoming slide here a little bit in more detail. And of course, why you need an analyzer. So I, I don't have mine with me. I've, I've got the rig analyzer. Uh, a lot of people have the MFJs. I think they're really, really important if you're gonna start building antennas, particularly for HF, that you have an antenna analyzer. Cannot recommend that enough. If you have um, a way to find one at a ham swap or whatnot, or you can just go out and buy one of the more 
they, they can be expensive. Um, I really recommend it. Or if you have one in the club, maybe bring your antenna to the club day and, and do a do an antenna tuning event. And tuners, again, I'll mention important and understanding how they work is is needed. But I think it's sometimes best, if you can, to cut to resonance. Um, this is about the, the first time I built a dipole. This dipole in particular was we were at a different point in the solar cycle and I was able to operate okay on a QRP radio with PSK 31 and that's just hanging from my fence so that's almost NVIS on its height and it was still relatively successful um, in that area so not bad but um, you can do a lot better with putting a ballon in there so at this point I started feeling like I'm not just the driver of the car I'm a part of the pit crew that I Operating is great. I love operating. I love being an operator and, and having fun with that. But it started opening the doors up of, of kit building and building more complicated antennas and, and working on different kinds of activities. Field day. Field day comes to mind uh, uh, often. And I, I started feeling more well-rounded in my abilities of being an operator. So not to shame anyone, but I found that the more I did, the more I got my hands dirty and actually started building stuff, the the more the hobby gave back to me in terms of fulfillment. And as I say there on that takeaway box, I started to value the journey, not just the goal. You know, it's, it's great to be able to snag that de-expedition contact like uh, Baker Island. I hit Baker Island. I hit Bouvet recently. Uh, not Bouvet. Uh, what was it? Ducey? Ducey Island. Um, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, that's the, the moment of operation that you, you build up to. But I got to say, I enjoyed everything that led up to that point, building my station and getting my antenna set up and, and all the fun I've had in different areas. So kit building, I'll mention this briefly because there's a lot of antennas out there that um, you you get to come in and kind of put it all together. And, and that's a good place to start. That's a lot of fun. This is uh, Bertha Peak in Big Bear, California. This is uh, doing a soda activation. This is just me by myself. Um, this is uh, 8,500 feet above sea level, and the antenna I'm using is a vertical made by QRP guys, a tri-band vertical QRP antenna. And so what I've learned from, from kit building antennas or, or plans you can find online, particularly for multi-band antennas, is there's compromises everywhere. You, you've got to kind of make some compromises either in mobility or, um, in this case, compactness. And you can't, you can't drag all the bands with you if you're only going to have one radiating element. You've got to add some, in this case, some uh, coils. And, you know, that's everybody's favorite is wrapping uh, ferrites. I think that's everybody's least favorite thing to do in ham radio at this point. And that uh, 20, cut to 20, I think that's a 17, about 17 feet uh, vertical element. Cut to band worked fine. There's four radials on the bottom that are elevated at, at its lowest point, about two inches above the ground. But the 30 and 40, which you controlled with the switch, um, not that great. And so that's, you know, something you experience, something you learn as you get out and you do. I've, I've done about three soda activations with this antenna. Um, had to build a guy line plate to go along with my fiberglass uh, pole that you're seeing there. And those are all things you kind of pick up as, as you go, as you figure, okay, well, I got to put this thing up on the top of a hill. I can't really just put it in the ground because the wind's crazy. So you got to guy it out and do all that stuff. So I started to ask from this deployment, how do I improve this in both speed of setup, speed of tear down, and maybe perhaps get a little bit better results on say 20 meter? Because as I learned, um, I don't know what soda's like in New Jersey. I don't, I don't know of many peaks in New Jersey. Uh, but 20 meters is kind of the band for soda. Uh, 30 is okay, 40 not so much because a lot of the op um, operation is in the day, early day, afternoon time frame. So this is just a quick shout out for QRP Guys. Again, that's their website, qrpguys.com. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. And this is their tri-bander. That's a close-up of the, uh, the feed point. And those are those uh, wound toroids with the switches that you control the bands on. It, it's an interesting, it's an interesting antenna. It's it's, it's nice to kind of have in your back pocket. And what's cool about it is you you put your hand through it and you wind up all the radials and the uh, your driven element right there uh, on that unit. And you can throw a rubber band around it, so it packs up really nice. And that's just a picture of my 
my camp there as I set up for, for doing that activation. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Um, the designer of that antenna is sitting right here in the room. Josh, Where's he at? Right CX. I can't. Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> I, I might have a problem in how I built that. I made a uh, video on it, and I think I screwed up on the 40. The 30 is good. The 20 is great, but the 40 I have problems with. So, well, now that I know that, I take everything back. It's the best antenna I've ever used. <laughs> You need, uh, you need a couple more radials, and you uh, you got to trim the toroids to uh, to get good resonance. Who is that? Where is he? He designed the antenna. Wait, I, I have made several thousand contacts of mine in uh, parks on the air. Oh, excellent! Okay, now I see you. That's awesome. Well, I didn't think I didn't know you'd expect me to show your antenna. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. I, I did not plan this, but uh, checks in the mail though. <laughs> Excellent. Enjoy. So, did you? Is, is that something QRP guys just made under your approval? Yes. Oh, yeah, very they, nice. Uh, they took my electrical design and said, "Hey, we want to do this. Is it okay?" And I said, "Sure." Oh, that's so awesome. They sent, me, they sent me a couple of the protos, and uh, they worked. And I said, uh, "Do it." That's terrific. Oh, that's amazing. You never know who you're going to meet in ham radio. Is he still there? Yep. Okay, uh, good. That's waiting fine. for the next slide. I don't know if you're which one you're oh, well, I'm running to the running, I'm the producer director and thank you for driving. Yeah, give give Mark a hand here. He <laughs> he's gone through a lot today to get this to work. On the air page right now. Yes. Okay. So there's my buddy, uh, KG6 HQD, Jerry. He's also on YouTube. Uh, pretty pro, pretty prolific in Southern California as far as soda activations. You can't look up any summit just about down here without seeing a, a review posted by Jerry. And that's a KG6 HQD. So getting into soda kind of really kicked my interest to ham radio and kind of do a deeper level. It was, it's one of those things I say, that this is a a lifelong hobby and there are so many niches that you'll go down and you'll experience so many different and interesting things all under you know under the the heading or umbrella of radio but soda is just one of the things that's super great because it, it really does get you out of the shack uh get you way above the noise level it's really impressive what you can do with um with that height and just a little bit of power it's awesome okay so Building different things kind of led me to just going back to something simple. I was going through the uh, ARRL handbook and, and at kind of Jerry recommending it as we were doing some activations. He's like, well, have you thought about just doing a doublet, something simple? So I ended up just doing a, a zip wire doublet out of uh, out a lamp cord. And I've had a great time just using that. In a lot of cases, it, it works just fine for 20 meters and, and it's a lot of fun. Um, Let's see. It's it's the cheapest antenna I think you can make, and it, and again, bring it back that fishing pole mast. eBay for fishing poles that you get from China or wherever, incredibly cheap. I think you can get a seven meter uh, pole for seven to nine dollars, which is just really really nice. And I think a lot of them are carbon fiber. How how do they ship that, Josh? Um, it usually, I don't think I have one with me, but usually it comes in a cardboard tube and depending on the largest segment, it's just going to be a little bit bigger and they're plastic capped on the end, usually with just packing tape. Those are, those have been the ones I've gotten so far. You say, you say up to nine meters, is that what you said? Uh, well, it's, seven. it's a, usually seven, well, they come shorter than that, but you don't really want to go under seven meters and, and there are some that go larger than, or longer than that but these are uh telescope are telescoping so they are they'll usually be somewhere in about this width depending on on how things are length about that long in fact do i have oh i'll come back I'm to it i work with spider bee that's our thing oh sorry i didn't hear that what was that i uh i have a spider bee i have an 18 meter Oh, well, there you go. So I think, though, with the spider beams and, and possibly some of the ones MFJ produce, they're kind of large. The lowest segment has a pretty large diameter. 
And so a lot of these activations that we do, you know, we're we're hiking up some some decent elevation, and and in a lot of cases we're not going out that far. Um, in fact, let me go. Could could I go back a slide uh, to Jerry with the um? So Jerry, there is. We're on a one point summit, and I think that was a over ten mile hike to get that one point all uh, out and back. And I thought it was going to be, oh, this is going to be easy. He's like, yeah, we'll just go do a one-pointer. It's going to be a snap. I don't know if you can see that next to him, but I dragged a, a field dipole with a trip with a tripod out, and it kicked my butt. So I, I have uh, since adopted the lighter the weight, the better for a lot of stuff. And, and right next to that is my fiberglass pole. Uh, that's a 27-foot fiberglass pole, and that's – the way I'm heading lighter, the better, the, the easier to deploy, the better. Uh, so learned a lot from, from a lot of different trial and error kind of things, but, uh, the spider beams are nice, but they can be heavy. So keep that in mind. All right. Talked about the dipole. Okay. So this is, uh, the picture of the zip cord antennas and feed lines. That's out of the wire. Where is it? That's the ARRL wire antenna book, I think, version three or revision three. And largely, this one's talking about the different types of wires that you'd use, characteristic impedance, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner. So that that's interesting if you are if you want to make something like a speaker wire dipole or a zip cord. It'll take you very little time to make it. Um, the length is is pretty simple. It's, it's 468 divided by the desired frequency. I cut them a bit long. And I'll connect it to my analyzer and tune it by folding back over the insulators. Lineman knot is used at the dipole kind of connection point. Very easy to do, which I recommend everybody try it out if they can. So next thing on my uh, my list of antennas to build is this Friday is my standard live stream that I do in California, 7 p.m. Pacific time. And I got asked to build just a bunch of random antennas. So we're going to do Christmas lights and coat hangers, I think, is the discussion. And so that's going to be the next fun thing to make. And lastly, not all homebrew, though. Uh, that is my uh, hex beam that I just set up on my base station. That's the one that I worked um, Ducey with not too long ago. So... I uh, enjoy homebrew, and mostly it's a lot of QRP, a lot of getting out in the field for me as far as the homebrew goes. But when I go home, I don't mind a, a nice uh, factory-made uh, antenna. Okay. So, any questions? We're, we're, we're having, uh, any questions from the audience? I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just amazed at everything that we've done here, and I've learned a lot. Thank you. You got an expert in the crowd. You could just ask him when we're done here. <laughs> Will any satellite antennas? Uh, I heard. So, can, can you, you repeat that? Johnny? It was a lot of echo. What was the question? Um, uh, what have you done regarding satellite antennas? Well, that Yagi that I, I was showing there right in the beginning. That's just cut for two meters, so you can work um, the International Space Station with that, and you can do APRS, which is kind of fun. Um, oftentimes, the FM birds are dual band, so you would need 70-centimeter uh, elements to go along with that. They're not difficult to homebrew something like that, uh, but in my case, I generally use an aero antenna with a duplexer built into it, and that is a, a great antenna, but you can build it. In fact, I you guys ever heard of uh, Walmart parking lots on the air? Did you hear about that? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. The the one of the uh, one of the achievements you could unlock is it was called the MacGyver, and if you went into Walmart and you sourced all the parts for the antenna from in the Walmart, went into the parking lot, built the antenna, and made a contact, you unlocked this achievement. And I believe a couple people were able to do it uh, over the course of those uh, Wumploda weekends, as they called it. So that was a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I was busy that weekend, but I thought that was pretty cool that people were that ingenious. So... 
What is your definition of QRP, John? Um, I'm more of a traditionalist, I guess. Usually five watts or, or lower. But at the same time, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, a lot of the Elecrafts are, are 10 watts. Um, the radios mm -hmm. that I'm using, there's three of them that I generally take out for soda is the Zaiju X5105, which is kind of like the Chinese copy of the Elecraft K, uh, KX3. And then I've recently kind of fell in love with the Hilltopper 20 by Four State QRP, and that is just a 5-watt uh, CW radio. We're going to be activating uh, a U.S. Islands on the air this Saturday, uh, Petty's Island in New Jersey. Uh, we will send you the band plan, and we'll have a group of guys out there portable activating that island. It's never been activated before. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I actually, uh, I've mentioned that I was doing this talk a couple of times, and I had the information, so I let people know that, that you guys are going to be out there and put the URL, uh, URL out there so that hopefully that drums up some support. The, the call sign will be Kilo 2 Papa. Kilo 2 Papa. And, and that's this weekend, right? Or so the 8th? Uh, right. 1330 Zulu to, to 1730 Zulu. And I, I, did I send you the band plan? Uh, I didn't get the band plan, but I think I got the information on the time and the call. Okay. But if you send me the band plan, um, I will do my live stream on Friday and I'll let people know if they can try and work uh, you. All right. I'll send it to you uh, either tonight or tomorrow. Excellent. Does anybody else have any questions with Josh? Is there any comments out of aluminum tubing? I think he said aluminum tubing. That is correct. No, I have not yet. Um, I I uh, had somebody throw out a TV antenna down the down the block for me, and I, I snagged that, <laughs> and I pulled the elements off of it and some of the parts, and I think I'm going to reuse it, try to make something out of it. I think those are largely aluminum. Are they aluminum? Or are they? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Barely. Barely. <laughs> yeah, barely. Yeah. Have, have you had any experience with mag loop antennas? Only, um, so I, I built a sky loop uh, for 80 meters. Well, I was with a, a friend actually built it. And that's about as far as I've taken it. I wish I could build one of those on my my home here. I don't have a big enough footprint to be able to do that for 80, but that's a, that's a fun antenna. Uh, I have not yet had the opportunity to work with a mag loop. That would likely be something portable. And since mainly I've been playing with wire antennas for kind of ease of deployment and weight, I've been usually sticking to wires. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Josh, uh, thank you very much for a yeah. great presentation. And we'll probably want to have you back sometime in the future. You, you gave us a lot of information and... And everybody here has, has been wrapped attention. So thank you again. Absolutely. And if, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, no, I was just going to say thank you very much. I appreciate you inviting me out here. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, if if you're interested, the the YouTube channel is Hosh Nasi, But on Facebook, we have the Ham Radio Crash Course where there's some more information that we post and whatnot. So if you're interested, you can check that out. And uh, if you have any feedback or anything you want to reach out directly to me, it's hoshnasi at gmail.com. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. And the email's good on QRZ for Kilo India 6 November Alpha Zulu. All right. Thank you, Josh. All right. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. And, uh, we'll see you soon. All right. 7-3. See ya.